you're here for an Emerald Ashbore public workshop. This is the first one we've done. The reason we did it this year is because our Emerald Ashbore population is growing rapidly. So we'll get into that as we go through. So speakers tonight, the three main speakers, myself, I am employed for you as the forestry maintenance supervisor. Been here 25 years. I thought I could retire before I had to deal with this issue. That didn't happen, so now we're dealing with it. But I brought two experts in with me tonight. Jennifer Burrington, right here. Raise your hand, Jennifer. She is the plant health specialist with the Minnesota Department of Agricultural. De deals a lot with Emerald Ash Borer. She is a good resource to talk to. And to her left is Steve Bow. He's the branch leader, branch manager for a company, a tree company called Save a Tree. It's a great company that work in the metro area and nationally as well. So he may talk more about that. I've got some additional staff here and I want them to raise their hand. My tree inspector, Kevin Sturgeliski, is over here. Kevin has been with me three years now, four years, going on his fourth year, and he is a great resource. If you call the city, he's the person you may talk to. Lauren Danson is my forester, field forester over here. And <laughs> he's on chairs right now. Lauren has been with the city over 20 years, so a great resource. Uh, Scott Anderson, is Scott here? He's with Sink, way back there, Save a Tree as well. So you can talk to him afterwards. And Adam Bergdahl is right over here in the blue shirt. Adam is the individual, if you call a contractor, Save a Tree, he's the individual who is assigned to the Egan area. So he's more than likely the person that would come out to your property. So that's who is here tonight. And we're just gonna, like I said, jump around. So I'm gonna let Jennifer take over. She's got some slides just to talk a little bit about EAB history and how it got into this country and where it is. Thanks. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Perfect. All right, so I'm just gonna quickly go through a um, little bit of the history. Emerald Ash Borer was founded in Minnesota in 2009. Uh, we've had, as you can see on the bottom, a slower spread than the national average for the national, According to the national average for how fast EAB spreads in each of, of, of the other states, we should be at almost half of our counties should have emerald ash borer, and we are not close to that. So some things that have helped play effect um, for that is cold weather. It does need to get down to negative 29 degrees or colder to kill emerald ash borer larvae underneath the bark, so it needs to get quite cold. Wind chill doesn't affect them, so that polar vortex we had a couple years ago, uh, did cut down some of the population, only about 60 to 70% of the larvae died. So think of that as how cold that was, it needs to get even colder than that. So that helps a little bit, but we can't always count on that. Next, we have a lot of education and outreach, doing these types of programs. We also have lots of workshops, lots of trained professionals out there that are helping people understand how to protect their trees and how to not spread emerald ash borer. We also have aggressive management by cities when they find it. They are actively removing infested trees, which cuts down on the population. Uh, there are also quarantines in place that help prevent emerald ash borer from spreading to new areas. I'll explain that in the next slide a little bit. And then good sanitation practices, making sure to process all the material, not move the material. If you have an ash tree and you're going to have it removed, don't move it very far. So it's about the one time you kind of want to be below average as a state. As for how many counties you know you have emerald ash borer in. And then to give you a distribution, we have the national map on the left here and then the Minnesota map on the right. I talked a little bit about, I mentioned quarantines. On the Minnesota map here, all of the red counties are quarantined for emerald ash borer, which means you cannot leave those county areas with ash or hardwood firewood or emerald ash borer. If you want more specifics on that, you can talk to me afterwards. But that is a snapshot of our interactive map that we have on our website, on the Department of Agriculture website, that you can always see which counties have emerald ash borer and which ones are quarantined to make sure that you are following the law. And then on the left, we have the national map. This is the green is the uh, native range of ash, and then all of the red dots on there are the first detections in each of those counties for emerald ash borer. So it's spreading pretty quickly out of Michigan. I can't say slowly, it's spreading pretty quick out of Michigan across the country. And a couple that I wanna point out that are not on the map are Winnipeg and then also Sioux Falls, South Dakota. 
Um, we're just within the past couple months here. So it is even spreading outside uh, of Minnesota as well. And emerald ash borer doesn't fly a couple hundred miles on its own to Boulder, Colorado. It probably got moved there by somebody taking infested firewood there. That's why it's very important not to move firewood. We really want to emphasize that. If you have firewood, don't move it uh, very far. Find firewood where you're going to burn it. And I just want to jump back in here and talk a little about where it is in the city of Egan right now. Uh, I'll get into this in a little bit, this graph here, but we first discovered emerald ash borer in the city of Egan, actually down in Lebanon Hills uh, near the campground down there. Believe it or not, Christmas Eve 2014, I got a call from the Department of Ag and they had discovered actually as one of their staff down there that found it. So uh, it's been in the city for three, three plus years now and it's spreading fast. And this slide here is one that's used uh, quite a bit to indicate that insect population growth and what follows that is tree decline from ash trees. You can see by the box in the middle where the city of Egan is right now, the numbers on the x-axis actually correspond to the year. So right, the arrow points down to the eight, so 2018. And you can see how fast that insect population is gonna grow and what follows that is the, the tree, the ash tree death. So we're assuming if nothing is done by the year 2022, it's gonna be pretty bad here. We're gonna have a lot of dead ash trees and that's kind of our message tonight about what we can do. On the City of Egan website, you can click on the forestry section. There is a link on there to Emerald Ash Borer and it is a map that when Kevin is out in the field and we document new sites, they automatically get put into this GIS system and it'll show you anywhere in the city where that tree is located. You can do a measurement from there. You can search for your own address and then uh, find out how close it is to you. The bad thing about the map is that we have it spread out over the entire city. You know, like I said, it started down in Lebanon Hills in 2014. You'd think natural spread would be just to kind of come north through the city. It really didn't happen that way. We have a lot of other ash borer that comes in actually from where it was first found in the state in St. Paul. So it's kind of coming across from the River Valley. So it's coming in from all different directions. It does kind of what is called a satellite spread. So you get a point, a tree in one neighborhood, insects leave that tree and they'll go to another one and they just kind of start spreading out kind of like fireworks patterns. And that's how it covers ground really fast. I don't think we have a lot of spread in the city from uh, unnatural artificial movement like firewood like Jennifer was talking about. But uh, we do have it just a natural spread. It's a small enough area, so. It's actually, believe it or not, getting to the hard, the difficult time of year to tell it because there's leaves on the trees. What we usually go out and, uh, and scout out emerald ash borer movement is uh, during February and March when you can see the, all the branches on the trees. Believe it or not, I don't know if we'll talk about this, if you will, Steve, or not, but woodpecker damage is one that you really look for at certain times of the year. So the question for you, Jen, the question was, how did it get to the United States? Good question. So it probably came on some type of packing material. Um, there was probably a um, pupae. Um, I'll explain when it comes to the life cycle, but the larvae that are underneath the bark will make a little pupal chamber about a half to a quarter, quarter to a half inch into the wood. And so even if you strip all of the bark off of a piece of wood, there's still gonna be pupae in there that don't need a feed anymore. They're just going to emerge as an adult beetle. So that is probably how it got here, is that there were some pupae in some type of wood material that made it across into Michigan and from there has spread out very easily. And we have lots of, lots of ash. We have a, almost a billion ash trees in Minnesota as a whole. We have about 998 million. So we have a lot of resources for this insect to go for. Okay, so I mentioned a little bit about their pupating, but I'll start in the beginning of their life cycle. Eggs are laid by female, adult female beetles. On the outside of the bark, the eggs hatch, and they burrow underneath the bark, and they are larvae. The larvae have a couple different stages of development, and then they pupate, like I said, into the wood, either a quarter to a half an inch, and then they will emerge as an adult beetle. Um, they are green. And then they will start the cycle over again. Uh, adult beetles are only active in the summer. So from about, in Minnesota, we have to give a general range, whether you're in southeast Minnesota or if you're in northern Minnesota. So sometime between May 1st and October 1st, 
Emerald ash borer adult beetles are going to be active in the state somewhere. Um, we have a really late spring this year, so the actual adult beetles have not started emerging from ash trees uh, yet. It hasn't been warm enough for them. And then they will continue to emerge sporadically throughout the summer. They don't all come out at once. And then in Minnesota, because we have such a short growing season, um, we actually have this insect will take two years to complete its development. But some of them still make it in one year. So to give you an idea of the two-year life cycle, an egg that was laid last summer is halfway through its larval stage right now underneath the bark. It'll continue feeding this summer, and then next summer, it'll emerge as an adult beetle. In Minnesota, we are kind of at that latitude where it changes about half of uh, the larvae make it through in a year and half of them make it in two years. So it's at any given time of year, any day, there could be a life stage of emerald ash borer, um, the larvae underneath the bark at any day. So that's why it's very important not to move firewood. I can't stress that enough, but um, so that's the life cycle of emerald ash borer. Adult beetles are only active for about 30 to 45 days in the summer and then they die. So they're not gonna, they're not gonna make it past a summer. And then how does emerald ash borer actually kill the tree? It's the larvae underneath the bark that are cutting off the circulation of nutrients and water in the tree. Not the adult beetles, not the eggs, um, it's the larvae underneath the bark. You start with one larvae in a tree um, in the branches and then you end up with thousands of them and they just keep uh, reinfesting that same tree over and over and over again until it's dead and then they move um, about a half to two miles on their own they spread each year but they can fly the adult beetles can fly up to five miles away so that's why sometimes you see these populations pop up five miles away and then host trees emerald ash borer goes for ash trees true ash so they go for black green and white ash are all native um, and found in Minnesota uh, they also go for blue and Manchurian ash. Most people don't have one of those species, but the most susceptible is the black ash and then green ash, and then white ash is a little less susceptible. And there are many cultivars of uh, black, green, and white ash that have been sold over the years. Um, just because it doesn't have the word white, green, or black in its name doesn't mean that it's not going to get emerald ash bar. The only one that you are safe is a mountain ash, because that's in a different genus, in a different family. So if you have a mountain ash, you are not going to have emerald ash borer. But you have berries. Um, so progression of symptoms, uh, what you would look for in your trees. So on average, on an average sized tree with an average emerald ash borer population in the area, the first year that your tree is infested, you're gonna have some small larvae. Remember I said they take about two years some of them make it in one year, but the majority will make it in two years, so you only have some small larvae. You don't see any signs on your leaves, on the bark, on anything on your tree when it first comes. The second year a tree is infested, you're going to have some of those larger larvae, and you might have some adult beetles that are going to be emerging from those larvae that made it in a year. Woodpeckers love to eat insect larvae underneath the bark of trees. They like to eat any native insects. They also like to eat emerald ash borer. So with emerald ash borer, if there's woodpecker damage in the mid to top canopy of the tree, that's where they start their infestation and they work their way down the tree. If there's woodpecker damage, there might be one or two woodpecks on a branch up in that canopy that second year. Most people don't notice it that second year. That third year a tree is infested, you're gonna see more woodpecker damage, probably a couple woodpecks on a couple branches up in that canopy. Um, and then you also might see some bark splits, which I'll show you a picture of. That is when most people find trees that are infested, is that third year. The fourth year a tree is infested, there's going to be more woodpecker damage. It's going to be probably onto the main stem potentially. And you're finally going to see some canopy impacts. So you're finally going to notice that there's a general thinning of the canopy, the top canopy of the tree. Um, it's not just dead branches. It's a general thinning. All the branches will still leaf out. It's just going to be about half as many leaves. And then the fifth, sixth, and seventh year, your tree is on its way out, and it's going to die, and it becomes a hazard. There are options for management. Um, you can treat trees if you find it early enough in the infestation, and there's still enough living material, which I think he'll talk about. 
Um, and that is possible. Um, and over time, I didn't really talk about it as I was going, but every year there's more and more larvae underneath the bark. Um, adult beetles, a lot of times they're kind of lazy, and so the same tree that they emerge from, they just walk down and lay their eggs on that same tree that they came from. And a female can lay um, about 50 to 200 eggs in her lifetime, so the population increases very quickly um, in a tree. This kind of goes back to that slide I showed you of the graph, that S-curve graph that accelerated real fast. We found emerald ash borer in the city of Eagle in 2014. We didn't have any new infestations that we saw in 2015 and 2016. That doesn't mean it wasn't here. That insect population was building. 2017, we started seeing a, a quite a few more. And now in 2018, Kevin can't drive around the corner without seeing another tree. So that is exactly what happens, insect population growth and how it affects the trees. So I'm talking about woodpecker damage. What am I saying? As woodpeckers go for larvae underneath the bark, they slough off some of that outer bark, and you'll see these blonde, light blonde patches on the tree. With emerald ash borer, because they start their infestation in the mid to top canopy, where the branches are about three to six inches in diameter, and the bark transitions from smooth to rough, that's where they like to lay their eggs, is in that rough bark. So that's where they start their infestation and start laying them. So if you stand on the ground and get a pair of binoculars, you can look at all of your branches, scan your branches for those light patches. And in those light patches, emerald, the woodpeckers, as they go for the larvae that are right underneath the bark, they will leave a dime-sized, oval-shaped, light-colored hole. I've learned a lot about woodpecker damage and the different types of holes that they make over the years. And with emerald ash borer, it's usually a very pretty small, dime-sized hole. Um, and it, as they are going for the larvae underneath there, they will slough off some of that bark. Now, just because you see woodpecker damage on an ash tree does not mean that it for sure has emerald ash borer. It just means that something is underneath there, some type of insect larvae is underneath the bark that the woodpeckers are going for. And it takes further investigation to say for sure if it's emerald ash borer or not. But it's a good sign that something is attacking your tree. And with bark splits, um, remember that picture I showed you on the left that had that single gallery that starts the whole infestation of the tree? Well, the tree will try to heal around and uh, continue to grow around those first couple larvae that infest the tree. And as that branch continues to grow, the bark is no longer attached to the wood because of that gallery, that feeding gallery from the larvae underneath there. And so the bark will crack open and you will be able to see these bark splits or bark cracks and you'll be able to see a larval gallery inside um, that. So that, along with woodpecker damage, would uh, indicate that there's some type of insect attacking the tree. So is that in the trunk or in the limbs? So that's in the limbs, so looking up. Um, I know everybody, when they hear that emerald ash borer is found um, in their neighborhood and they're in their city, they run outside and they look at the trunk of their tree at about four feet off the ground, four or five feet. You're not gonna see anything there until about five years after the tree's infested. So looking up into the canopy, uh, if these insects were to attack the trunks of the tree, they would cut off their food source right away because they would stop the flow of nutrients and water across the whole tree. So they wanna utilize that tree as long as they can. So they start at the top and they work their way down. So looking up, don't do it too much when you're driving because it's distracted driving. But when you're standing at home, you can get out and look, scan your branches. It's a great April activity to go outside, look at all your branches, make sh look for the woodpecker damage. If you have a pair of binoculars, that helps. So we kind of set the presentation up in a, in a process to know a little bit about what emerald ash borer is, how to look for it, and then we do the same thing in the city of Egan. I just want to talk just a couple of minutes about this. So again, Kevin Sturgeliski is our tree inspector. And I have the number here, our main number, 675-5300. And don't call everybody tomorrow <laughs> because mm -hmm. Kevin, believe it or not, is getting a lot of calls. But we want, we want to hear from you if you suspect having an emerald ash borer. That's how we monitor where it is. So the service we provide, Steve will talk a little bit about the private companies, how they can actually get on your property. But what we do is kind of an initial inspection to see kind of where it is. Uh, Kevin will get out either by request to come out and look at your property, or we just do a drive-by, a random drive-by. We actually have a doorknob hanger that we would hang in your doorknob if we see something, say, hey, we happen to be driving by, we saw that your tree, your ash tree looks suspect, 
you might want to give us a call or take a look at it or, or take further action. So that's how we kind of start out here. Uh, we do have, uh, Jennifer mentioned, a lot of ash in, the, in uh, the state. We have a lot of ash in the city of Egan. This number here is 52,000 ash trees is from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. It's a sampling number, so it's very broad, basically. And that is just trees on private property, not your boulevard tree, not the tree in your front yard. It's those trees in the back of the lot, some, na some privately owned wooded areas. So that's a lot of ash trees. That's a lot of food source for that insect to go after. A uh, little bit about what the city requires. We do have a shade tree disease program which covers Oakwald and Dutch Elm that requires the removal of infected trees. We do not have that yet for emerald ash borer. That is just, that is not a disease, an infection like Oakwald or Dutch Elm is. It's just an infestation of insects in that tree. The city council made a decision a few months ago not to require the removal of ash trees on private property. We strongly recommend it and encourage it to slow the spread down and to, to minimize the problem, but we do not require that time. And that second paragraph, I know Steve will talk about this in a minute. The longer you wait to remove that dead tree, the more expensive it's going to be and the more dangerous it is. And I know he'll get into that a little bit. You should have picked one of these up in the back. This is something that the tree inspector will hand out. And this is a converted flow chart from the Department of Ag. Actually, Jennifer helped me do this. We customize it to the city of Egan, kind of to the diameter of trees and to the, to the climate a little bit. It's a flow chart to help you from, I think I got emerald ash borer, to the very end, what should I do with it? So I won't go much more into that, but take a look at that. If you didn't get a copy, the, it is available on the website. Yeah, almost everything that you're getting as handouts <laughs> today is on the internet someplace, so. A little bit real quick, and then I'll let Steve take over about what does an ash tree look like. There's lots of different trees in the city, and not, obviously not all are ash trees. Ash trees are kind of unique. They have what we call a compound leaf. So the image on the left is just exactly that, anywhere from seven to nine leaflets, we call it, on one leaf. So look for that when the tree has leaves on it which I mentioned before we do our inspections in February and March when there aren't any leaves. But then we, look, we can look at the bark of the tree. Ash trees have a real characteristic diamond-shaped bark on them. This is the mature bark, not the smaller branches that Jennifer talked about, but look for that as well. A Couple other things up, the small photos, the top one, opposite branching. A lot of trees have a staggered or an alternate branching. Uh, ash have alternate, and they will also have these canoe-shaped seed pods that are formed in the fall and they kind of persist on the trees through the winter. So those things you can use to identify, you know, your ash tree. We get lots of calls, my ash tree's infested and get out there and it's a box cellar or a maple or something. So it's good to know what you're looking at. I'm gonna let Steve take over now and he's really the guy that you wanna to listen to because there's only so much we as a city can do, but what you can eventually have to do is call a contractor, whether it's Save a Tree or somebody else, they're the ones that are gonna give that exact prescription and how to hand, handle and manage your trees. Well, thanks for having me here. I guess the, the main thing I want to kind of bring home to you guys, because what's important to you guys and how you manage your property is up to you guys, right? So how you made that decision of whether you're going to save that tree or remove it, it's about a plan or an action you created. So it's really about making that decision and getting a hold of somebody who, who can help you make that management decision. Because you manage your property, everybody's going to manage your property a little different. Um, it's, it's each day when you made a decision where you're going to live or what you're going to do for the afternoon, you made a plan. Same thing with your property, how you landscaped it. Is that tree valuable to me? Because trees are an investment, right? Um, they're there for shade protection. They're also there for aesthetics. So saving those is an investment. Um, or removing them because they're not an asset to that property. You have to make that decision and that's why contacting um, a company to come up with that plan is, is vital so that way you understand the health of the tree like Jennifer talked about. Um, it, it's at that point, can we save it or can we not? Does it need to come down or does it not? So making a good plan from the get-go so you understand what you have on your property and what you could do or, or um, should maybe not do. You know, I look at making a plan as kind of a, a three-step process, right? Um, you have a couple different options. You can integrate a couple into make it however you want. But one option is obviously take that tree down and have a replacement. 
we talk about replacement. When we are looking at reforesting not only the city but your private property, make sure we're choosing those trees in the right spot. You know, is it the will it fit in there? Is there power lines? How close to the to the house should I stick it? So have a plan. Talk to an expert about where those trees should be located within your yard. Treatment is an option. You know, we talk about it's here. All my trees are gonna die. Treatment is an option, you know. Jennifer laid that, that six year plan out there. Really, if we're looking and we can, as a homeowner are struggling to see if it's infested until that fourth or fifth year, well at that point, treatment's really not an option. So thinking proactively, how can we treat those trees ahead of time? How can I make that plan ahead of time so I can treat it in that one, two or three year stage where that tree's still healthy and I can attack those larvae that are attacking, attacking the health of the tree. And that's where treatment's a, an option. It's a really good option. Treatment's also an option if you have a lot of ash trees. Maybe you can only afford to treat them for so long because treatment's a, it's a long-term investment. Not all trees on your property may have that investment requirement. But it also allows you to space out your removals on your property. So you could treat for a few years because that chemical, certain chemicals can last up to two years in that tree and be effective to fight against the beetle. So you use treatment as a staggered removal process. So using that integrated approach of how are you going to attack your property is critical when you're looking at um, managing your property for shade trees um, in the aesthetics. So treatment is an option. Now there's a, a number of chemicals out there um, and they're all varying in size. Uh, I would recommend that anything over about a pop can size, I, I would uh, not treat with their stuff you can buy at Home Depot. Um, the, the stuff that professionals can provide you are for larger trees, and, and that's where you're going to get your best efficacy. Um, using the, the stuff from the big box stores just isn't, isn't going to work and isn't strong enough to fight that beetle on larger trees. So you got to think about that investment too. You know, and if you think about removal, you want to think about who's coming to take my removal tree down. Is it an option? Is it somebody that knows what they're doing or is it a guy with a pickup, right? Because you're going to have all those people and the price may vary a lot. But one thing that save tree has done nationally is we set um, ash tree standards. Um, there was some handouts in the back and I didn't know if we brought enough. But we talk about that decline of the canopy and how we set standards that we won't allow our climbers to get into those trees if they're so declined. Uh, we talked about if there's too much decline, we're going to need special equipment, cranes, um, lifts to get into people's yards. So you got to think about that making that plan early. That's critical. And if it is removal, it's easier to take it down when it's alive because we can have better access and we can put our climbers into those trees and that price stays down at a more manageable site. But if we wait and delay and say, well, I'm going to wait and see, that's when we get into the, the more expensive removals and that's where it can hit the pocketbook. But to know that we're setting standards out there for the industry it is when you're looking for companies accredited with certified arborist, trained staff, um, those, are, those are things that we take to heart, you know. Uh, we do a lot of training in-house and with uh, seasoned professionals. This is one with a professor from the University of Madison. So it's about getting people that are educated and building a plan that is great with good people. So if you, if you invest the time early, um, it'll help you in the long run. But just think about that plan early um, and think about who you're hiring to do that work because in essence, it's your property and you want it to, to look the same either when they got on the property or when they left the property. So there's some of the contacts from our representatives here um, and we will float around throughout the uh, end of the presentation too. Thanks, Dr. Yeah. <clears throat> Steve had a good point about you know, acting early, having a plan. Ashwood has got a unique characteristic that when it dies, and becomes dry, it gets very brittle. If you see images of cities that have gone through the EAB wave before, there'll be limbs this big just falling out of dead trees and that becomes a real liability to not only the tree companies that have to get in there and remove that tree, because removing a dry tree is very dangerous and that's why their costs go up, but it also becomes a public and private liability too. I had another speaker who was going to appear tonight, but she couldn't make it, and there it should have picked up a handout. It's probably the thickest one back there. I think I've got a copy right here. And uh, it looks like this.
those that are sitting up close enough can see it. And on the front, it says damage done to trees. Actually, this is just subsections of an article that uh, uh, an individual, her name is Lori Strom. She is a master gardener and an attorney. Put this packet together. And just two things in here I want to point out. I'm definitely not an attorney and I'm not an insurance person, but a lot of people call us and ask about liability. If I leave that tree standing up and it falls in my neighbor's yard, who's responsible for that? So just two things I want to mention. On the third page in here, there's a good section on hazard trees. What is the definition of a hazard tree? Well, a dry, brittle ash tree on the property line is a hazard tree. It can do damage to property and or the people. On the seventh page in here, that's where it gets into insurance coverage and damage caused by trees, hazard trees, and trees falling down. So as a private individual, I would be very concerned about that. The reason I bring it up is, I mentioned we do not require the removal of ash trees on private property. I kind of wish we did, but that creates a whole other animal. So we strongly encourage it. We get lots of calls from people that, well, thanks for pointing out my dead ash tree. I just can't do it. I can't afford to take it down now. If you wait four years or five years, it's probably going to cost four or five times what it does to take it down now. So we know there's an investment. And like Steve had mentioned, come up with a plan. Maybe your plan is to protect some trees and remove other trees. If you do nothing, the experts tell us, besides us up here, all ash trees will become infested with it if you do nothing. So you have to start thinking about what's going to happen. I've got two ash trees in my yard this big around. And right now I'm probably doing what most of you are. I'm just kind of waiting and seeing what has to happen to it. But sometime I'm going to have to make a decision to either protect through chemical injection or remove the tree. So liabilities is a real important deal. And if you get on the Internet, you can find that full article. Search Minnesota tree laws and you'll find this entire publication. With that, I want Jennifer to talk just a little bit about kind of the future, kind of what's going on with emerald ash borer treatments. Their Department of Ag is doing some pretty interesting things with biological control, things that we really can't do, but hopefully it'll slow down the, the, the large picture of EAB spread. Yep. So like they've mentioned, um, it is in your best interest to act early, try to get um, a decision made in that two, one to four years of infestation. If you have a dead tree, it is just going to start dropping limbs and start falling over, and it is a huge, huge hazard. The city of St. Paul is a perfect example of that. They've had emerald ash borer since 2009, and they are removing trees. They still have a couple of trees that are not infested yet, um, but it's very, very few. And they removed trees um, that were a couple years infested, so probably that three to four range, and they fall nicely. They can easily take them apart and uh, chip them up. And then they removed some that were probably pushing that five, maybe six years of infestation. And they, as they dropped the tree into the road like they've done for all their other trees, it just shattered. They are very, very hazardous. Pieces went flying everywhere. It is not safe to remove dead trees. So it is in your best interest, if you're going to remove trees and not treat them, to remove them before they're completely dead. And like they keep saying, it is cheaper. So it is actually... Um, as much as it is a pain to have a city come through and tell you to remove your tree, having them let you know when they see that your trees are infested gives you that advantage and gives you a chance to get it down or treat it at a cheaper rate. And you can remove trees in the winter. It's a great time to do that because emerald ash borer adult beetles are not active. It's only the larvae underneath there. And so if you remove a tree in the winter, sometime between October 1st and May 1st, that is the best time to remove it. Uh, in the summer, it is not a great time to remove ash trees, and these are just our best, recommend best management practices, so they are our recommendations. They are not the law. The quarantines are the law, but this is just what we suggest you do. We say don't treat or don't uh, remove trees in the summer because those adult beetles are active, and as you are removing those trees, remember I mentioned they're kind of lazy insects and they like to lay their eggs on that same tree. Since you disturb those beetles on that tree, they're going to fly to your neighbor's tree and actually spread the infestation further, faster. Instead, you can leave the tree up for the summer and remove it in the winter when there are no adult beetles active. And then the company that you hire will probably chip any of the small branches on site, and then they will bring the larger pieces and probably chip them or grind them 
before May 1st um, at another location. It is best if you're going to remove a tree yourself to, uh, the best way I like is to burn it. There is absolutely nothing left. There's no way an, a beetle is gonna come out of that wood because it's all burned. So burning it is best, but if you can't burn it, chipping it works great too. If you can't chip it, then move it the least amount of distance possible. On the Department of Agriculture website, we do have a listing, depending on which, if you have other properties in other counties that might have ash trees, we do have a listing of, of uh, sites that accept ash material in each of the counties that has emerald ash borer. So that information is on there as well. But um, if you can, avoid cutting down and removing or trimming ash trees in the summer if you can. We understand that storms happen, and if your tree falls down in the summer, go ahead and do it. Just try to limit how much you do with it. And then, like uh, Greg mentioned, we are doing biological control. So if you, um, it's nice in landscaped areas, you can easily uh, drive up to the front of somebody's house to their tree in their front yard and you can either remove it nice and easily or you can treat that tree very easily. If you have a nice big forested environment, you're, you can't get in there easily and take out trees that are infested because you're probably gonna hit other trees when that tree comes down. And you're not going to apply chemicals in those environments because it's not, it's not going to be worth it. It's in a forested environment. You're not going to dump a bunch of chemicals on. Usually ash are found around wet areas. So what we have for forested environments as a management tool are biological control wasps. These wasps are very, 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 very tiny. The top one here is about the size of a speck of sand. I do have a display case in the back that has examples of these. This one is about the size of a gnat, and this one is about the size of a small mosquito. You will never see these coming around you. These are parasitic wasps. They only attack emerald ash borer. They went through many, many, many years of testing to make sure that they only go after emerald ash borer. They can only complete their life cycle in emerald ash borer. So these three wasps we have been releasing for about seven years in Minnesota, and we have released over 500,000 of these wasps in areas that have emerald ash borer. Because they require emerald ash borer to complete their life cycle, we have to find emerald ash borer in these forest environments first, and then we release these. We cannot pre-release them. So this is about the only management tool available for our forested env environments. This, these still do not completely get rid of emerald ash borer. At this time, there is nothing that completely eradicates the insect. You can treat individual trees and protect them, but we can't get rid of, there's no way we can get rid of the insect as of this time. There is also a native insect. It's called the smoky winged beetle bandit wasp. Also, Cerceris human penis. Got it, yes. Um, the there's a volunteer program called Wasp Watchers with the University of Minnesota. This is a native insect that we have here in Minnesota that goes after adult metallic beetles. Um, Buprestids in particular. Emerald ash borer is an adult metallic buprested beetle. So this is a native wasp that we have in Minnesota that attacks the adults. Um, this volunteer program that is through the University of Minnesota, you can sign up to be a, a part of that. They usually go out to ball fields and collect these wasps to see if they are preying on emerald ash borer in the area. So it's a native insect that we have that goes after the adults. So we have uh, biological control going after adult beetles. We have biological control wasps that are going after the eggs and after the larvae. So as a whole, it is kind of trying to manage that population so we don't have as much of an exponential curve like we showed you in the beginning. So it's a slower, slower curve. We're just about wrapping things up here. I know Steve mentioned this a little bit, but we get this asked a lot too. I have to take this tree down. How am I going to refill my yard up? Two things on that, you know, as trees grow, they get bigger. If you had six trees in your yard when they were small, two inch caliper trees, you may, you may only need two trees when they're mature size. So again, finding a spot and where you can plant it, where you have room, like Steve mentioned, that's, that's pretty key, that's the first thing you should look at. This is a publication that's through the National Arbor Day Foundation, and you'll see this a lot in different forms. The right tree in the right place. Small trees, 
you can put them in a small area. Some of the major native trees around here, like the oaks, they have a lot of oaks. That's a large tree. It's going to take a 50-foot space, 60-foot space up in your yard. Keep things like power lines in mind. So these are probably things you've all heard before, but location, 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 again on that. You need to know where to plant that tree. Nothing worse than having too many trees in your yard. Actually, funny of me to say that, but it is. It's not good for the trees or for your property. And there's all kinds of ways you can do research on what is the right tree to plant around here. There's publications that have tough trees for tough sites. In Egan, we have typically a lot of bad soil, heavy clay soil. Not many trees do very well on that. You want to put that beautiful orange sugar maple near the fall in your front yard. Sugar maples don't do well, real well in hard soil. So keep that in mind, uh, what you put where. A lot of trees are native to Minnesota. There's field guides out there to what works. Uh, next, a plant hardiness zone. We got a lot of people that bring up different trees from down south. I loved it down when we went down on vacation, brought it up, didn't make it here. Obviously, the climate has a lot to do with what will grow here. And the last thing, like I just say on the bottom here, you know, sometimes that research is just, just going to Bachman's, just going to Girton's, walk through their yard, see what they have there. Plants that they have here will grow in Minnesota. They would not buy ones that will not grow here. So typically that's the case. Find something you like, you know. Trees are meant to be fun too and just kind of enjoy out in your yard. It's not all strictly business. So find something you like and is adaptable to this area. The last slide, and I know there's a lot of people will try to get some questions and we're a little bit ahead of schedule basically, but this is just a good wrap up here. And I don't know if you can read that, but it's on different screens, but just some things to keep in mind. And I use the same presentation to the city council and the park commission and the energy commission. But there are some things under that are just, again, just to keep in your, in your mind here. Top on the next five years, it's going to be critical in emerald ash borer management. We're on that slippery slope going up that graph now. So what a lot is going to happen in the next five years. So toolbox, think about that multi-toolbox, what you can do. Without ash tree protection, quote, all ash trees will become infested and die. And then you've got brittle trees to take care of. Property owners should diagnose tree condition, make appropriate management decisions. That's something Steve talked about. You're not going to do one thing for every tree in your yard. Treat some, remove others, wait and see on other ones. That's exactly what we're doing in the park system. We can't do everything out there. We don't want to protect, chemically protect every ash tree in the city. We have way too many of them. So we're doing a little bit of both. And that's just a good management tool for no matter what you're managing. Uh, next one down, some high quality ash trees should be protected. We are treating some boulevard ash trees 30 inch in diameter and larger. There are some really nice ash trees here. You may have some in your yard. So chemically protecting trees by getting a good company can do it. That is very effective. If, if they could say 100% effective, they would on that. But 99.9% .9 effective as long as it's repeated as needed. So uh, many existing ash trees will and maybe should be removed. Ash unfortunately are not the most beautiful tree you know there's some when they get older they tend to start falling apart brittle wood they break a lot in storms so maybe some of those in your yard actually just should come down and lastly like we always say to minimize a future situation like this we went through this with dutch elm disease where we planted the streets full of elm trees we went through it with oak wilt disease Mostly those are natural trees, but to prevent this future catastrophe, diversity is always the answer. If you want to remove and replant trees in your yard, don't buy five autumn blaze maple and put them on your yard. Pick just a few different types. If you can have less than 10% of your trees in your yard of one type, basically, that's the good thing. In our park system, we have still hundreds of ash trees. We have less than 10% of ash in our parks right now, and that's a goal we're working for. So. Get it down to that manageable, manageable uh, uh, number of ash trees when you have to deal with it. So there's a lot of people in here. We are ahead of schedule a little bit, but what we'd like to do, maybe we'll take just a few questions until 7.30, but after that, there's seven of us that here were introduced. We'll just wander around and feel free to, to gather us. You got lots of information with you today. Our city website uh, for the forestry division has lots of information on that. You have our phone number, so feel free to do that. But like you said, we'll try to answer some questions. Whoever among us is the best to answer. I'll just try to Go ahead. Is that me? Yep. Can I just say that one of the handouts is the Homeowner's Guide to Insecticide Use. It goes through very nicely how to decide if you should treat your tree or not, and then gives you 
the options that are available to both professionals and to homeowners, and then how to measure your tree and determine if you should treat it um, with a professional or not. So that is a very nice handout. It's laid out very nice and easy. If it's the only thing you read, please read this. The question was, if you don't see any signs of EAB in your tree, can you start treating it now, preventively? Yeah, that's what I would recommend. Um, yep. As long as emerald ash borer, as they say, is within two miles of your residence or your property, you should start doing something. Yep. Question right here. We can take. Does it matter what type of year you treat it? Yes. Who wants to answer that? Yes. In that handout, it tells you, um, based on which chemical you choose, when you can apply those chemicals. So that would be my recommendation. Certain chemicals are meant for the spring. Certain are for the fall. Um, it, it goes through very nicely how you would apply each of them. But usually in the spring, if you're looking for um, the two-year yep. chemical, um, with the trunk injections, if you have a large tree, uh, we recommend we recommend that. What you're relying on is that tree's action of basically breathing, pulling up liquids through the, the ground, up through the vessels of the tree and out through leaves. We rely on that action to carry the chemical throughout the tree. That's why it has to be repeated every two years. New growth is on the tree that doesn't have the chemical in it. And you got those new tips which could get infested. So if you're wondering, don't just charge you every other year just to get money. It's because the tree is growing, basically. Over here. Everybody hear that? So what's the cost of chemically treating a tree? Yeah, so when we look at price, it's really a volume-based <coughs> thing. So how much size of tree do you have? Because the bigger the trees are, the more volume of product you're going to need for those trees. So industry standards is typically 5 to $10 per inch of that tree. Diameter. So if you've got two, you know, a 24 and a 12, that's about roughly, you can kind of see the low end and the high end. So, so measure the diameter of the tree if you just want to measure the circumference, divide by pi, take it times an average seven and a half dollars an inch. That'll give you a pretty good idea. Average ash trees in the city of England probably cost two to two hundred fifty dollars to treat. Something like that. That's every other year. He's asking about the life expectancy of ash trees. Yeah, they're about a one hundred, one fifty. I was gonna say about a hundred. Um, so you have a good amount of time left. Um, one thing I always like to throw out there is if you're going to think about selling your house in 10 to 15 years, re um, property values are great if you have a large mature tree in your yard. So if you're thinking about it, you're probably not th you might not be thinking about it today, but if any thought in the future of selling your house in like 10 to 15 years, you might not have as large of a tree if you remove it. So it is um, a good thing to think about, should I treat my tree if I'm going to be selling my tree in the f or selling my home in the future? You can put a couple rounds of treatments in there every other year and utilize, maintain that canopy and maintain that value to your home to, um, for when you sell it in the future. So that's something to think about as well. Way back here, it's hand up in the gray t-shirt. So the question is, um, how is emerald ash borer going to progress through Minnesota and into the future. Pretty much right? Yeah. Okay. Good question. Yep. So it's hard to say um, what exactly is going to happen. We can see how it has gotten here so far, um, and we can see how much we are doing at this time, but it is expected, um, we don't know again for sure, but it is expected that as the initial wave comes through here, um, through Minnesota and has been coming from Michigan, Emerald ash borer is going to linger in the area. It's not going to just move on through and keep going. It's going to linger. There always are going to be some ash trees that might get missed that they don't see that are small right now and that will grow larger later that they will go back to to get. So it's going to be a pest that is going to be present for the long run. Unless science and something changes, it's going to be here forever. So any of the, it's kind of expected to see just like with um, Dutch elm disease, you're going to see smaller ash trees in the environment, but you're not going to have those large um, uh, ash forests that we have currently in the future. Um, they just kind of reach a certain point, and they will die from having so, so much uh, infestation from emerald ash borer. I think your correlation to Dutch elm disease was a pretty good one. We had the Dutch elm wave go through in the 70s, late 60s and 70s. We still have Dutch elm today. 
Kevin is marking Dutch Elm trees now. So there are some survivors. As long as there are tree survivors, there will be that insect, you know. Once you run out of all ash trees, EAB is going to go away. That's all they feed on. So it's a matter of, you know, the predator-prey type of thing, if you want to think of it. Predator is the EAB, the prey is the tree. So one big wave, several small ones after that probably. So Good yeah, question. so if you're going to treat your tree and you want to save it, you would have to keep doing it for the entirety. On the back side of this homeowner's guide to insecticide use, it tells you how to measure your ash tree to get the diameter that they would use to figure out the cost. And that's a standard that was set up years ago because tree people and loggers are lazy and they just like to measure <laughs> things right here. Actually, They're also it is. tall. <laughs> Why bend down to measure it? So it's always It's always right four and a half feet. So that's yeah, pretty yeah. tall for me. Question. Let's just do two more questions, and we'll we'll mingle, and we'll have plenty of opportunity to talk. We'll take you, ma'am, and then you, sir, over here. So we can't repeat the, the question. Sound effectiveness a little bit longer, but that getting into that third or that fourth year, we start to see some dieback. So in order to the label of the products from the chemical manufacturers, they don't want to support much more than two because they can't guarantee that it's going to give you the full protection. So you start to see a little bit, there is a little protection, a little wiggle room there, but they, but they want the maximum protection if you're going to make that investment. So two years is fresh. You can be, if you want to be kind of a risk taker and a gambler, yep. you can deviate yep. from the set schedule. Just realize that you might get some damage from some emerald ash borer larvae underneath there. Um, if you deviate from the set schedule, depending on what chemical you use and the ones that he's talking about for the two years, um, you could push it out to every three years. Say you have three trees on your property, treat one each year. So you know you're going to have that cost each year. You don't have to treat all the trees on your property that same year. Yeah, good point. You can divide it up. Great question. They said if you plant new trees, do some reforestation. Any city ordinances or rules about where you can plant them? Uh, within the street right away, there is. We prefer nothing to be within that, usually it's 10 to 13 feet because there's so many utilities underground nowadays. You have to do an underground locate to find what's there and chances are there's gonna be something underground there. As far as side property lines, I don't believe there is a city ordinance on that. Then a lot of common sense comes into play. And then again, that trees and the law publication is pretty good. You plant a tree that's five feet off your property line, the crown grows 45 feet wide half that tree is going to be over your neighbor's property, dropping things on his property. So I guess I'd keep the size of the tree in mind, but there are no written that I know of rules about private property where you can place that tree. If you like your neighbor, put a closer property line. If you don't, you know. So that was a good question. You know, that's always an issue. We get lots of calls on that. And as a city staff, we don't come out and settle civil issues like that. That's a private issue, so. Two very last ones, then we're going to break up right here and then <laughs> okay. back here. Anyway. So the damage that the larvae do underneath the bark has already been done. The tree, yes, is going to callus around that and continue to grow, but you're always going to have that damage in that area until it gets large enough that it grows around it again. So you'll have those bark cracks. But because they start in the top and if you catch it early, you're not going to notice as much damage. But whatever you have done, whatever is done is done. The chemical actually kills the insect, doesn't heal the tree. Correct. It's not the purpose of the chemical is to get taken up into the leaves. And as the females, they do a little bit of maturation feeding. So they feed on the leaves before they lay their eggs. And so they will get a dose when they eat the leaves. But because it is tr being transported up the tree, the larvae are in the phloem and it's getting transported in the xylem and it will get a dose of that as well. So it kind of hits it both ways. But the main focus is getting the adults on the treatments. Great question. Great question. Last one. That was my question. Is how does, what does the chemical do to the... Uh, yep. Yep. Perfect. Yeah, got two in one. That was a great question. <laughs> well, again, uh, those of you that are staff are here. Kevin's back there. Lauren's back there. I see Scott is still here and Adam. Feel free to mingle around and ask us. Thank you for coming. And watch out for green bugs. <laughs> There's some more back there. Yeah.